hiring a professional, someone who knows microphones, it's really going to make a huge impact on the quality of the film and how it's perceived. Take the time to pay attention to what you've just recorded because it's really difficult to go back and get it a second time. Get to know the sound of the microphones you're using. If I was going to buy any one piece of equipment as an entry level person, it would be the headphones. Our roles have really changed from being production sound mixers to multi-track recordists. My name is Fernando Delgado, and I'm a production sound mixer. My name is Frank Schering, and I'm a sound editor and re-recording mixer. I did get a boom pole shot once, though. Shot. What's up, Frank? How's it going? How you doing, my brother? Doing great. Welcome to my world. So we're going to talk production sound. Okay. And the key to production sound is the right microphone in the right place at the right time at the right level. So let's take a look at some microphones. Awesome. So uh, I have an assortment of shotgun mics out here. All right. So you've got short, medium, and long, right? So you're going to have different patterns on these. So what, what would you use this one for? Uh, the short shotgun mics. Uh, Nine times out of ten, you're going to use that for interior dialogue. They have a much wider pattern, typically, than, let's say, a medium or a long shotgun mic has, so it's got less off-axis rejection, mm -hmm. but it's got a much tighter pattern. So, um, And just because of the size of the mic, because it's shorter, booming in areas that have lower ceilings and stuff like that is also a little bit easier. Um, so that's a great microphone for interior dialogue. Um, stuff like that. Also, those microphones, in my opinion, are really great for sound effects, especially really loud stuff like uh, gunshots. Oh yeah, you wouldn't they think so. A lot of SPL. You you'd be surprised uh, how hard it is to break a microphone with sound. Um, I've I've done a lot of high caliber weapons, and I've put the microphones right next to the weapon, mm. and. I've never broken one because of the sound pressure. That's crazy. I did get a boom pole shot once, though. Shot? Yeah. Yeah, I ran out of mic stand, so I, <laughs> I taped a boom pole to a tree. We were recording 22 rifles, and my boom pole took a ricochet. <laughs> <laughs> so I still have it. I don't want to get rid of it, so it's got a little slug in, the, in it. But yeah, and then uh, long shotgun mics, something like this would be really great for a wide shot. Um, you know, something where maybe you have a big jib or a crane um, and you could use this to, to get some really good stuff from far away. Awesome. I love the NTG3s. This is the B, but I don't have the black version, I have the silver version, but I love these. They sound great. So you're using that for interior dialogue, big shots. What about lobs? When are you going to choose a lob over a shotgun? Um, well, now that wireless technology has become more readily available, um, we're, these days we're putting lobs on just about everybody. All the time. Uh, nine times out of ten, it's what a lot of producers want. Um, in some cases it might not be the best sounding solution, but depending on the shot or the type of uh, project that you're shooting, mm -hmm. it might be the best option. I also use my lobs um, and other types of microphones like this one for uh, planting. So if we're doing uh, a scene, let's say in a car, mm -hmm. I might hide a lav in the visor of a car. Lavs are really great for certain types of sound effects, whether you're hiding the microphone because you don't want people to see them so that you can capture uh, sounds people are making, or I've actually taped lavs to underneath wheel wells in cars. Mm -hmm. Uh, to get tires and oh, just nice. the si sound of tires and stuff like that gripping the road. So you said you put them on the visor in the car for auto interiors and that's because it's going to be pointing down at the person speaking, right? Yeah, so that, that uh, is a really good segue to mic placement. It's not just the mic selection uh, that is, is important, but it's and sometimes even more importantly is where you place the microphone. Okay. So in that scenario, um, exactly. You, 
you place the microphone in a visor that is typically just above somebody's head, and if they're speaking forward out the windshield, for example, mm -hmm. right, then the microphone is going to be in the perfect place to capture their dialogue, but it's going to be far enough away to where you're not going to get any breath noise or mouth noise or any sure. of that other sure. unwanted noise. Would you ever do, maybe if you have two people in the car talking to each other, would you ever do three, one on each visor and one in the middle in case they're turning some? I've never put three in visors. I've done two in visors and then sometimes I've done, depending on what it is, maybe on the back of seats. I've done some where um, we'll put them in the center console somewhere. And actually in a couple occasions where lobs didn't seem like it was the best, sh like there were a couple times where the shot was a little bit more, it was just a little bit wider. So I couldn't get a mic down there. So uh, we take like a gooseneck and a short shotgun and put it in a cup holder. Oh. and just point it up towards the talent, you know, and I've done it where I've got one going in each direction. Um, I've also done this, the same technique for getting car sounds. I've done a couple car commercials and we'll get the shifter uh -huh. and I'll just put it like right there while they're going and you get all that great uh, shifter noise. Right. So now when you're doing that, it's because you have to because of the shot, right? But ideally with the shotgun trying to get dialogue, you don't want to be pointing up at somebody, right? Actually, so a lot of people are real sticklers about the direction that the microphone points. Okay. I think because I have a music background, I don't really care which way the mic faces. Um, a lot of people, for example, will boom only from up top, uh -huh. right? Well, this could work as well. If I'm in an environment where let's say Let's say it's all tile roof, or it's a, a tile floor, or cement floor, right? Um, well, coming from underneath just might be a better option because I don't have reflections up above. Right. Right. Um, so, so that's generally how you know for booming, you know, and that, but the same thing goes for here. So if you have a really tight shot, right? And there's, um, let's say you are doing interior, and it is really. Uh, you know, boomy or whatever, it might make more sense just to come from underneath and use that person's body to help block with some of the sound if you uh -huh. can't do something to do something else. Yeah. I don't ever hold myself to any rule that, you know, the microphone has to be like this. Mm -hmm. Now, is it, does that work better most of the time? Yeah, it does. Um, uh, it works for the shots right. that we're getting because of the way the cameras are positioned, the way lighting is, and the action of the person speaking. A lot of times it does make a lot more sense to come from overhead, mm -hmm. but it's not a rule for me by any stretch. Because most of the time the shots are framed just above people's heads, not exactly. with a lot of room. And, that, and that's the case even with wide shots. A lot of times when I'm working uh, with the camera person is I'll ask the camera person, uh, get a wide shot. You know, give me your wide. If you're, we're doing an interview or we're, we're rehearsing something, show me your wide shot, okay? Now, I don't wanna be in your shot. So, am I in? Am I in? And I just keep asking him, am I in? And then eventually they'll say, okay, you're in. And then I'll creep it right back out. Mm -hmm. So I'm right there on the edge, right? Um, also, when you're booming, uh, you wanna aim for the chest, right? If you're aiming for the mouth, you're gonna get a lot of mouth noise and it's just nasty and it's one of my biggest pet peeves in yeah the world. It's, it's my kids hate eating with me because if their <laughs> freaking cheerios are too crunchy i'm like boy <laughs> shut it <laughs> talking about blocking sound you've got the foam screen on there so when are you going to choose the foam over like the zeppelin um so wind protection is you know uh, in our world wind is the enemy um, I would say always have at the very least a foam on, on your microphone, uh, your shotguns in particular, they just tend to be a lot more sensitive, um, than a lot of other microphones. Um, the reason we keep the, the wind foam on, and I'll demonstrate is cause if you don't have one and you make even the slightest movement, you're going to hear it. You know, you'll hear the wind hitting the microphone. So, um, I would just always keep at the very least a small windsock on, on your shotgun mics um, and that'll prevent any um, light movement from being heard uh, as far as wind. Um, 
you have stuff like this, these fuzzies, um, as well as your Zeppelins. This is outdoor use. This is, so what I normally do is if it's a beautiful day outside and there's like hardly a breeze, foam. All because day. it's lighter? Because it's lighter. Yeah. And that is the bigger reason is it, does this affect the microphone sonically? Yeah, a little bit, but I defy you to really identify what characteristics of the microphone right. are affected. Um, it uh, definitely doesn't affect as much as wind. Right, right, absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, so it, it really has a lot to do with weight. I mean, this, this guy is pretty heavy. Just the pistol grip alone yeah. um, is pretty heavy. A lot of people will have this style of mount with the pistol grip. I don't like that. This is my preferred setup here. I just want to have the, the suspension system and the microphone, mm -hmm. and that's it. That way it's super light. See, and I use these with NTG3s, and I just prefer like this for getting sound, for sound effects. For sound effects, yeah. You know, no pole, no, unless I need to reach out for something. Right, you know. which is great. For, yeah. And that's, that's why those have the pistol grip on them. No breeze to super light breeze, mm -hmm. foam is perfect, mm -hmm. right? Anything where it's uh, almost windy, kind of breezy, a fuzzy will do the job, absolutely. And they make these in all sizes, not yep. just for my finger. Mm -hmm. um, and and then anything where, if the grips and electrics are putting more sandbags on their equipment to keep things from falling over, I'm breaking out the That's Zeppelin. That's the determining and, factor. Yeah, generally. <laughs> it's The thing is, surprisingly, this will go a really long way. And if you feel that yeah. compared it doesn't weigh anything. I've got a few of these so, longer ones. But they, yeah, they, they really do a fantastic job. They go a really long way. Um, so I only ever use the Zeppelin mm -hmm. when it's absolutely necessary. Or I'm doing something like sound effects where I have a pistol grip and I right. can just, it's nothing. Right. If you're a new filmmaker and you want to have a quality mic, not spend a lot of money, what kind of gear do you need? What mic are you going to get? A lot of people ask me, what should I buy first, right? I'm getting started in this. What should I buy first? Okay. Um, my answer to that is nothing. Don't buy anything. Rent, right? This microphone might sound beautiful. And, and I might want this microphone because it sounds beautiful, but I might find that the majority of the work that I'm doing, for some reason I got into a group of people that only shoot in the Amazon. And when the hell am I ever going to use a microphone that's great for interior mm -hmm. out there? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to. It's not the right mic. It's not the right mic. So what I suggest people do is rather than spending all their money to try to accumulate a bunch of equipment, spend a little bit of money to rent and demo all these different microphones. This microphone has very different characteristics from this one. and this one has even more different characteristics, right? So right. each microphone is going to sound better to you or to me, depending on our ears, mm -hmm. depending on all of those things. So I would say rent. And then when you hear the microphone that fits your style, that you really love, that you see using all the time, then I would go ahead and get that. For the situation that you're in, right? Because yeah. you have to have the right mic right. in the right place. But right? I think a lot of times what filmmakers will find is you, you tend to shoot a lot of the same type of stuff. Uh -huh. Like, you know, if you're a documentary filmmaker, you're probably going to make another documentary. Right. If you're a feature filmmaker, you're probably going to make a, another feature. So I think each of these microphones will play well on your style. You know, it's kind of like a musician playing a certain instrument. You know, they're going to like this instrument versus that one for whatever reason. Right. So I think that's all very similar. So if you're a new filmmaker, which one of these are you going to use? It, it really depends on what you're shooting. Right. What, you know, what area of entertainment do you work in it, you know um, but I think what's even more important is that you listen to everything and figure out what works best for your style okay. you know every product on the market whether it's a microphone set of headphones mixer recorder whatever they're all going to have their own attributes that are either going to lend themselves to your style or they're going to hinder your style mm -hmm. so it's a lot like choosing an instrument okay you just got to find the right one yeah you just have to find the right the right tool for what you're trying to produce one of the problems that I have to deal with on the post side, uh, with lavs specifically, is like clothes rustling, or yeah. like if someone's—I have a lav on now, so I apologize. You know, someone like hits their chest 
you know? Right. And then you have to, I have to fix that, take the time. So how do you avoid noisy clothes or whatever with your life? Um, so the first thing that I do that tends to get me in a little bit of trouble sometimes is I will expose the microphone whenever I can. So I will take a look at my talent's wardrobe and like with what you're wearing right now and the color of my lavalier mic, I'll probably just run this right into your button and let the mic be exposed. Mm -hmm. um, and then hope that nobody that is looking at the monitor ever notices that it's exposed. And that's because when it's sticking out, it's gonna get less clothes movement. Right, it's not gonna get any clothing. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, the, the compromise there is you can't be shooting in a windy area, right? Because I have right. to take all my wind protection off. Buffeting. Right, so there, there are some compromises there, but nine times out of 10, I can place the microphone in a place mm -hmm. that sounds consistently good mm -hmm. without any type of noise. So it could be rustle free sure. uh, the entire day. But um, if you have to hide them. And, and in most cases you do, you know, especially if you're doing scripted work, um, you do have to hide the microphones. Um, and so my suggestion is always uh, take a look at the fabric and, um, you know, certain things breathe a lot easier than others. Materials that breathe more are gonna lend themselves more to allowing you to capture good sound, okay. right? Uh, cottons tend to not make so much noise, but fabric has a lot to do with it. So um, one of my suggestions is if you're the filmmaker, be aware of these things. And if you have a wardrobe department, talk to them about it or mm -hmm. allow the person that you're hiring in your sound department to talk to wardrobe and be like, hey, this is what we're gonna be doing. We would really like to be putting these people in materials that lend themselves to good sound. Right. It's not always easy to do. And in most cases, uh, people would just laugh at you and you have to go about <laughs> making it work anyway. But um, it's always worth having the conversation. Mm -hmm. And then um, as far as placement, there's all sorts of really cool tricks that you can do. You know, Take a look at the wardrobe. Um, a really good example would be, let's say there's a man in a suit or, or a woman right, in a suit that has uh, coat pockets, mm -hmm. right? If, if the show owns that wardrobe, not the talent, but the show, the, the, the people producing the show own that wardrobe, I can cut holes in it, right? If it's not gonna get returned back to where it came from, right. I can cut holes in it. So I might take that microphone and run it on the inside of a pocket to where it's almost exposed, right? It's perfect placement, but then the wire is going in inside the clothing yeah. through a pocket or through a hole and then I might hide the transmitter in a breast pocket or in some other kind of a pocket or like you know for what you're wearing right now if I didn't want to see the pack I might cut a hole in your pocket and then just ask you to keep the pack in your pocket mm -hmm. right and then there's no danger of the wire ever being exposed sure so but a lot of it has to do with just paying attention to the materials and then figuring out you know okay well this material moves a lot so what am I going to do to prevent my microphone from hearing that movement. Sure. You know, That's great. there's all sorts of crazy things that go into it though. Like people shaving, for example, like if men shave their chest, like if you're working with an actor, they need to shave every day because if they don't, it's going to sound horrible because everything that they wear is going to make noise just because of all the stubble, mm. you know? So like, there's all this stuff that I never wanted to learn about <laughs> <laughs> that people do to their bodies. <laughs> But you know, certain things make noise and you have to take those things into consideration because uh, the mics don't discriminate. People say, oh, well, isn't there something you can put on there? Well, no, our ears discriminate. Our ears can choose what they're gonna hear and not hear. Our microphones can't. Mm -hmm. One thing I see a lot in uh, indie films and stuff like that, uh, you know, entry level projects is, um, I notice a lot of off axis mm -hmm. recordings. Same. Right? Off axis meaning that the microphones were probably not pointed at the source um, when they were recorded. Right. So what a lot of people don't realize is that just because the microphone might kind of sort of be pointing at you, but it's not, they, they think, well, it's still gonna be okay, right? But that is in fact not the case. It's gonna sound completely you know? different. So if you are in a position where you can rehearse with camera so that you know where your microphone should live during every moment of the shot, that's going to give you a much better uh, sounding product at the end of the day versus, you know, somebody's talking, so I'm just pointing the microphone in the air. You know, it's going to sound like a microphone's in the top of the room. Because you're like going to know that that 
actor is going to be walking from here to here, so you can have that mic in right. front of them. Yeah, instead the of right hanging the microphone in the middle of where they're going to go, yep. so that it kind of sounds like this, and then it comes up, and then it goes back down like that. Right. You know, at least this way you can have a nice consistent sound across. But for entry level sound people, get to know the sound of the microphones you're using. One of the things that I did when I on my very first job as an ENG sound person, I was doing freelancing for ABC News and I had never done field audio before. It was I shouldn't have been doing these jobs. It <laughs> it was much higher level than I should have been doing for my first go. But one of the things that I did to kind of familiarize with myself with the equipment is while I was sitting in my hotel um, waiting to get a call to go out to work, I sat in front of the TV with my shotgun mic and my mixer, and I put my headphones on, and I just moved my microphone back and forth, and I listened to where exactly was the sweet spot. Mm. And that really helped me when I finally got out to the field to have a really good general idea of where the microphone should live. And then, of course, you make tweaks with your ears as you're, as you're, you're going. But um, it's a really great practice. So if you are an entry level person or if you're a filmmaker that's interested in doing sound on your own, get, get the microphone, put it into a mixer and a, a set of headphones, and then turn on the radio, turn on the television, and then just listen to the microphone, move it around, listen to the phasing happening, listen to how the pattern is there. And after a while, what's happened with me is I can visualize it. I know that when I have certain microphones, I can almost see the pattern. Hmm as I'm moving the boom through the air, you know, so I know where I need to be. I know how far away I can be from somebody and know that I'm still going to be right on. So you mentioned mixer. So where are you aiming for levels when you're recording? Right. So gain, uh, level, having the right microphone in the right place at the right time is really important. But if you're recording too hot, that's bad. Distortion is the enemy. And if you're recording too low, you know, technology is really great and you can do a lot with a low level recording. At the end of the day, if you have a low level recording, all you're really doing is bringing your signal to noise up in post. And so getting the right level is really important. And uh, rule of thumb for me, I'm a little old school. I grew up in the analog days. I record as hot as possible without distortion. So I typically don't look at the meters when I'm setting my trim. I look at my talent or I close my eyes and then I turn up my trim and I listen to where, cause it, it's a really interesting thing with a lot of mic pre's. W once you get to a certain point on it, it might be really hot, but something about it just sounds good. It's, it's almost like falling into a groove almost, you know, I, I don't even know how to explain it, but, but a lot of times what I'll do is I'll get that level set and then I'll back it down just a smidge. Mm. And then, and that's usually um, money, so. But well, you're monitoring on headphones the whole time, so if you yes. hear something clip, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, you're, I'm you're always, riding it. You're, I'm always listening. And, yeah. and actually, another thing in regards to that is I'm, I always use the same headphones. I've, I've been using the same headphones since I very first started, and the reason is because I know how those headphones sound, mm. right? So I'm not putting on this manufacturer's set of headphones and then a different manufacturer's set of headphones the next day, because obviously they're going to sound very different. Sure. So I always use the same headphones, even if I'm using different mixers and different microphones. Um, that way, when I hear a problem, I can identify it faster. It's not a problem with my driving my headphones too hard or something like that. I, I'm actually clipping. Yeah, actually, if I was going to buy any one piece of equipment as an entry level person, it would be the headphones. It's A, it's inexpensive and you can use them forever. But yeah, record as hot as possible without distortion. That's my rule. Some people would tell you to be a little bit more conservative. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm just going to have to do production audio on one of your films and you're going to just be like, oh man, it just sounded so beefy and awesome. What's the first thing you do when you get to a set? Uh, the first thing I do when I show up on set is I talk to the first AD. Uh, the first AD is without question the most important person in my world because not only are they going to tell me what I'm about to do but they're going to tell me the entire sequence of my day mm. right so um, if there's something on the schedule for example in the call sheet the first AD if something changed the first AD is going to be the first person to know about it so that's always the first person I go to when I first started working in this business um, I always heard people make comments like waiting on sound like it's some kind of a funny thing or something right um, so I always took it very personal, even though it wasn't ever meant to be taken personal. One of my practices now 
so that I never hear that on set is that I'm always one step ahead. Mm. In a lot of cases, if production needs to move a light or they need to change a lens on a camera or there's a wardrobe you know, malfunction, they get all the time in the world to make those changes. Mm. If I go to a producer and I say I need to move a microphone, then it's like the end of the world. Oh, God, oh, waiting on sound, oh. Right, and <laughs> so one of the things that we always do and we encourage everybody that does sound is just be ahead of the game. It's one of the reasons talking to the AD is, is great because they're always gonna tell you what's up next. Mm. So you can always anticipate and be ready so that nobody's ever waiting on you. So sometimes I get uh, audio you know, from a young filmmaker uh, and I maybe I only get a mixed track, right? So there might be two or three actors. Uh, and then other times I get separate you know, channels for each person. So how do you decide when are you gonna be mixing together, when are you be tracking, or do you always record separately? When I first started, it was all about a two mix because we didn't have uh, recorders that had an ISO. Today, our, our roles have really changed from being production sound mixers to multi-track recordists, mm -hmm. I guess, for lack of another term. Um, our, our main focus really is delivering high quality ISOs. Now, anytime I'm mixing anything, I'm going for gold. So if I can deliver a really money mix and hand that over to somebody, that's great, but nine times out of 10, because of the capabilities of our recorders, the fact that we can record so many channels uh, individually in the field now, my main focus is really making sure that all of my ISOs are money. Mm. And so if I, if I have a flub in my mix, I'm not as critical as I was once. Today there's ISOs to save us. Right. So, um, but you know, along with that, comes responsibility that there's a lot more uh, data that has to be transferred to people in post, uh, labeling tracks, you know, keeping all the metadata stored correctly, file uh, naming and format and stuff like that also has to be taken into consideration. Absolutely, it's a huge help in yeah. post. Yeah, but if you can deliver a good mix, then I would say go ahead and do it. You know, um, that's the goal at the end of the day is to try to make the post-production their job easier. So if I can deliver a, a mix, I will. Thank you for that. Yeah, do what I can, man. <laughs> anything to make your life, anything to get us to the bar sooner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>